All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Danny Hoffman. I am the interim director of the Henry M. Jackson School of International Studies. And on behalf of the Jackson School, the Foster School of Business, and the University of Washington, it's a great pleasure to welcome all of you here today and online uh, to this important conference, Chips and Chains, Trends in U.S.-Taiwan Business. Now, let me begin, as we always do at our public events, uh, by acknowledging that we are on Coast Salish territory, the traditional homelands of the Duwamish, Suquamish, Tulalip, Muckleshoot, and other indigenous peoples. The Jackson School and our partners understand that the international community includes sovereign American Indian tribes, First Nations, and indigenous peoples across the world. Now, I'm honored to have the opportunity to open this event because I think it really highlights one of the core functions of a public university uh, in this somewhat chaotic moment in history. Uh, we are here to help create a space to have an informed conversation about pressing world issues that impact all of us. I think built into the DNA of both the Jackson School and the Foster School is the understanding that there's a lot of nuance required to understand global relationships today. One needs a firm grasp of culture, history, language, and politics, as well as an understanding of economics uh, and business practices in order to engage in the present and plan for the future. So I think over the next two days, you're really gonna see how rewarding and insightful it is to take that basic principle seriously. So I wanna thank everyone that made this possible. Um, our guests and visitors will be presenting here today and tomorrow. The staff, faculty, and students of the East Asia Center and the Taiwan Studies Program in the Jackson School and the staff, faculty, and students of the Foster Global Business Center. So with that, it is my pleasure to introduce Professor Deborah Glassman, Teaching Professor of Finance and Business Economics in the Foster School, and the Faculty Director of the Global Business Center. Dr. Glassman's academic expertise is in global business, international finance, and macroeconomics, and she'll give our conference and keynote introduction. So thank you and welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, it is uh, my pleasure to welcome all of you on behalf of the Foster School of Business and the Global Business Center, uh, a Department of Education Title VI Center. Uh, and we often partner with the, our fellow outreach centers and Title VI centers in the Jackson School. And I would note that in preparing this particular conference, the partnership was remarkably easy. That's we had meetings where we the agenda was, let's figure out the theme of the conference, let's figure out what the agenda, the program is going to look like. And I have been in meetings in the past where we spend re a remarkably long amount of time trying to sort through that. That was not the case in this instance. That's so we went, managed to come to an agreement very quickly on the program. If we're going to talk about U.S.-Taiwan relations, we're going to talk about trade, we're going to talk about supply chains, we're going to talk about semiconductors. That was really easy. What was actually kind of hard was coming up with a name for the conference, and we didn't get to the very clever chips and chains uh, until well into the planning process. Uh, but the, uh, the program was, uh, was quite obvious for us. Now, I have the honor of introducing our distinguished keynote speaker, Ryan Haas. He's a senior fellow and the Michael H. Armacost Chair in Foreign Policy at the Brookings Institution, where he holds a joint appointment with the John L. Thornton China Center and the Center for East Asia Policy Studies. Additional details of his impressive resume are in the program. Uh, it, the program is available by clicking on the QR code, which appears here periodically, uh, or the bit.ly link. Uh, but I do note that uh, his resume leaves out some critical information, which I would like to provide. Uh, Haas was born and raised in Washington State, and he graduated from the University of Washington. He's one of us. He's a dog with a W. Uh, to these details, I will add that he co-authored a newly released book entitled U.S.-Taiwan Relations, Will China's Challenge Lead to a Crisis? Very apt topic. And the ink is barely dry on that book. It was released April 15th. I'm pleased to present Ryan Haas, who will speak on the topic, How Will Rising Competition with China Impact U.S.-Taiwan Trade? Well, thank you, Deborah. Uh, thank you, Danny. Thank you, everyone, for, for this opportunity. Um, it really is meaningful for me to have this opportunity to be here. 
for a couple of reasons. Um, first, Taiwan is near and dear to my heart. It's an issue I care deeply about. And judging by the fact that you are all foregoing 75 degree heat in Seattle on a Friday afternoon, it's an issue that you also care deeply about. So I appreciate being in your company. But it's also important because this is my alma mater. This is a place that means a lot to me. And it's an opportunity for me to speak in front of my family, uh, which is at the, the, the center of my heart. And so I appreciate everyone giving me this chance. My task is to offer a perspective on how rising U.S.-China competition will affect U.S.-Taiwan trade and economic relations going forward. And to, to help get at this question, I want to spend a few minutes at, at the start talking about the overall context. In other words, describing how U.S.-China competition is intensifying and how it's being felt in Taiwan and Taiwan's economy. And then I will try to close with a few modest suggestions of steps that the United States and Taiwan could take to bolster Taiwan's economic security, which I view as sort of the foundation uh, of its overall national security. Now, I will do my best to be efficient uh, with these remarks because I think the real value of our hour together is going to come in the conversation. But to set the stage, I want to uh, start with the statement that Taiwan's Minister of Defense made earlier this week. Minister Cho said that his forces would be prepared to defend Taiwan and its people, as well as its material and its strategic resources from attacks from any direction. He said, if they want to bomb this or that, we will not tolerate it, which is a reasonable, predictable statement for him to make, except for the fact that he was not talking about China. He was talking about the United States. He was responding to a statement that Congressman Seth Moulton had made that the United States should be prepared to, quote, blow up Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company if China ever invades. In other words, Minister Cho was explaining that his armed forces would be prepared to defend Taiwan against the United States if the United States sought to blow up the crown jewel of Taiwan's economy to prevent it from falling into China's hands. And this is the upside down, black is white world that we increasingly find ourselves in when we talk about Taiwan issues these days. As context, Congressman Moulton is a Democratic congressman from the state of Massachusetts. He's a former officer in the Marine Corps. He has strong national security credentials. He's a rising star in his party. He is not a fringe member of Congress. And he was speaking when he made these comments to the Milliken Institute's annual conference in front of a group of financiers, uh, thought leaders, members of the media, uh, and others. This was not a low-key setting for spitballing about out-of-the-box ideas. Now, I, I wanted to start here because I think it sheds light on a few important dynamics that are at play in the U.S.-Taiwan economic and trade relationship. And I will get to China in a moment. But first, why is Congressman Moulton talking about firing missiles at Taiwan companies? Why does TSMC matter so much? And at a deeper level, why is Taiwan so important to the United States? I think that, that Taiwan matters significantly to the United States and frankly to the world for a couple of reasons. I'm going to highlight four here, but I welcome others to add to or amend this list. The first reason is that Taiwan is the beating heart of the global economy. It produces almost all of the world's advanced processor chips that run everything from our cars to our computers, from our watches to our refrigerators, pretty, pretty much every digital device that, uh, that our life depends upon. And as a point of comparison, um, the OPEC countries, the Organization for Petroleum Exporting Countries, they, uh, they have significant influence over global energy markets. They produce around 40% of the shares of the world's oil production. Taiwan's share of global chip production is orders of magnitude higher than OPEC's share of oil production. Taiwan produces over 90% of the world's most advanced chips. And as a consequence of this, the United States trades more with Taiwan than it does with France, than it does with India, and than it does with every other country in the world save seven, because Taiwan is America's eighth largest trading partner. So the first reason why Taiwan matters so much to us is because it is the, the beating heart of the global economy. The second reason is because there's broad public support in the United States for Taiwan. We care deeply about um, Taiwan. It's driven by shared interests, shared values and by sort of a tradition in the United States of standing up for the little guy who is being bullied by big neighbors. In this deep support, it's reflected in public opinion polls, it's reflected in statements by members of Congress, and it's reflected in the words of our president, 
President Biden has said four times publicly that the United States would be prepared to go to war to defend Taiwan if it ever came under attack. The third reason why it matters so much is that Taiwan is really critical to the credibility of America's security commitments. America's allies around the world look at Taiwan as sort of a canary in the coal mine. Uh, they think that if America abandons Taiwan, then they may be next. And this matters a lot for us because America's status as the world's only truly global superpower depends upon our network of alliances and partnerships around the world. And if America's allies begin to doubt the credibility of our commitments, then the overall network of alliances will begin to unravel. And so Taiwan's relationship with the United States has implications that extend far beyond Taiwan, but also the, the standing of the United States in the world. And then the fourth reason is that Taiwan is critical to peace and stability in Asia. The, UN, the United States has made a bet that Asia will be the most critical region of the world for us in the coming century. We see Asia as young, as dynamic, as the engine of the global economy. And our view is that Asia's economic growth depends upon regional stability, and regional stability depends upon the avoidance of war in the Taiwan Strait. So for all of these reasons and more, the United States really believes that it is deeply invested in its partnership with Taiwan and in preserving peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait. And this gets me back to Congressman Moulton's unfortunate statement last weekend. My sense is that he was reflecting and reacting to a darkening mood in Congress that conflict in the Taiwan Strait is inevitable and potentially inescapable. There is a growing presumption among the members of Congress that I speak with, at least, that China will invade Taiwan at some point in the future. And this presumption is compelling members of Congress to look for new and novel ways to try to defer, deter and, uh, and, and prevent China from invading Taiwan. And this impulse is taking expression in a variety of ways. For some members of Congress, it's motivating them to urge the Defense Department to accelerate their efforts to strengthen uh, military capabilities around Taiwan. For others, it is causing them to argue that the United States should abandon Ukraine so that we can focus our resources and our energy and our attention on Taiwan. And yet for others, it is causing them to search for ways to seek to limit the benefits that Beijing could derive if it ever were to gain control of Taiwan. Under the assumption that if we reduce the benefits that Beijing could derive, that it may compel them to not uh, pursue a path of, of taking over Taiwan. And I think that Congressman Moulton's comments sort of fall into this latter basket of, of impulses. And the assumption in this thought process is that China wants Taiwan to gain control of the world's semiconductor chip production. And once it has gained control of this critical sector, which drives the global economy, then China will have leverage to exert its influence and do what it wants around the world. So in other words, Taiwan is a strategic asset, and it must be kept from China's grasp. And this idea of, of Taiwan as a strategic asset has long roots. It traces back to at least uh, World War II, when General MacArthur uh, argued that Taiwan is an unsinkable aircraft carrier that we must keep on our side. And there have been variations of this argument in, in the decades since. And the updated version of General MacArthur's argument is that Taiwan is the cork in the bottle. It is what is preventing China from acting on its expansionist impulses. And that if China were to gain control of Taiwan, then it could move to the Philippines next, and then it could move beyond that. In other words, there may be a domino effect leading China to dominate Asia at America's expense. And if this logic sounds familiar, it should, because it rhymes with history. A similar argument was used to advocate for American involvement in Vietnam. And these types of arguments are being fueled, at least in Washington, DC, by an uncomfortable feeling that China is winning. And if China is winning, then the United States must be losing. And damn it, we need to do something to stop this trend. And it's, it's informed by you know, the fact that China's military is advancing rapidly. They are exercising their capabilities around the north, south, east, and west of Taiwan in ways that they never have before. They are practicing missile barrages. They are exercising blockades. 
And there doesn't seem to be a lot that the United States or Taiwan seem capable of doing to stop this trend. And this, this mood of China winning and therefore America losing is understandable, but it's wrongheaded. Differences between Beijing and Taipei are an artifact of an unresolved Chinese civil war between the Kuomintang and the Chinese Communist Party. For Beijing, Taiwan is the last jewel needed to complete its crown. One of the founding missions of the Chinese Communist Party when they took power in 1949 was to try to unite all of China, greater China, under one banner. And since 1949, the Chinese have asserted control in Xinjiang, in Tibet, in Hong Kong, and Taiwan is the last piece that, uh, that stands outside of their grasp. And this mission to try to you know, unite all of China, greater China, as they conceive it, under one banner actually is not an invention of the Chinese Communist Party. It dates back to the period preceding, including the Qing Dynasty and before. Now, I should also note that our friends in Taiwan are similarly determined to preserve their political autonomy and democratic way of life. But my broader point is that China's thirst to acquire Taiwan has been a continuous through line of Chinese strategic thought when China was weak, when China was in internal tumult and turmoil during the Cultural Revolution, when America had unrivaled primacy uh, in the latter part of the Cold War and the early post-Cold War period, and then on to today. So in other words, China's desires for Taiwan are not new. They're not an outgrowth of China's growing power. They are not uh, a symptom of Xi Jinping's rule. They are deeply embedded into Chinese strategic thinking. China is not interested in Taiwan because of semiconductor chips. And so threatening to blow up Taiwan's most important company, and frankly the world's most consequential company, is not going to dampen China's appetite for Taiwan, but it will poison views uh, of the United States and Taiwan among some of our friends, who naturally resent the idea of being bombed by their own friends. And I dwell on this because this is one of the risks of allowing U.S.-China strategic rivalry to gallop away out of control and subsume how we look at and approach our relationship with our friends in Taiwan. So if, if U.S.-Taiwan relations become subordinated to America's rivalry with China, there will be growing impulses to instrumentalize our relationship with Taiwan for our competition with China. And I want us to avoid falling into that trap. Because the people of Taiwan are our friends. They are critical partners. They are not pawns. They are people who we share common interests and common values with. And if we allow things to, to devolve, it won't be just our trade and economic relations, but really the entire U.S.-Taiwan relationship that will suffer. And just to be clear, I'm not warning about a future hypothetical scenario. I'm talking about the present. There are voices in Taiwan today who are beginning to question America's motives for its relationship with Taiwan. There are leading academics like Xie Chang Tai who are warning that Taiwan needs to be cautious about getting squeezed between the United States and China. He and others warn that the United States' goal is to strangle Chinese companies that could propel their advances in advanced semiconductors, supercomputers, artificial intelligence, and advanced computing. And his worries are not driven by imagination. They are grounded in facts. If we look at Taiwan's exports to China over the first four months of this year on a year-on-year -year basis, they have dropped. They have dropped over 20-25% according to China's custom data. And there are a variety of reasons for this drop, but one of them is that America's new export control restrictions on sales of high-tech products from Taiwan to China are having an impact. And this matters significantly for Taiwan's economic competitiveness because China is Taiwan's largest export market. And it's a significant export market. To put this in perspective, uh, Taiwan, around 40% of Taiwan's overall exports to the world go to China and Hong Kong. About 15% of them go to the United States. 
And whereas the United States relies heavily upon consumption to fuel our continued economic growth, for Taiwan, exports are really a, a critical source of their, their economic strength. Taiwan produces much of the intermediate goods that get sent to factories across Asia and, and put into final assembly for, for products to export. So if Taiwan loses opportunities to sell its products, it also loses economic vitality. And economic strength is the foundation of, of national power. So if intensifying U.S.-China competition causes Taiwan to significantly lose export opportunities, and if there is no new offsetting expansion in, in op, uh, places for Taiwan to sell its goods, then Taiwan's overall economic model is going to struggle. And so this is something that we must uh, keep in mind as we chart our way forward. But America must also be mindful of, of one other concern, which is gaining momentum in parts of Taiwan. And to be sort of undiplomatic about it, it's a fear that the United States cares more about extracting Taiwan's value than about preserving Taiwan's security. And this, this concern gained urgency in Taiwan following a statement that was hardly noticed in the United States, but that was uh, certainly noticed in Taiwan. It was a quote made by our Commerce Secretary, her name is Gina Raimondo, and she was speaking last year to the Aspen Institute, and she said that it is unsafe and untenable for the United States to continue relying on Taiwan for all of its advanced semiconductor chips. So she urged the United States to engage in a Sputnik moment, to invest considerable resources to strengthen America's domestic production, production capacity so that we wouldn't have to rely so much upon imports of chips from Taiwan. And she made these comments as part of a lobbying blitz to try to encourage Congress to pass a CHIPS Act, a $52 billion package to subsidize semiconductor fabrication production in the United States. So even though she was speaking to a domestic audience to try to advance a piece of legislation that would strengthen America's economic competitiveness, the message I think was heard differently by some of our friends in Taiwan. The message there sounded like the United States does not have confidence in Taiwan's future security, and so we want to transfer production and know-how of the world's most important chips from Taiwan to the United States before it's too late. And this statement has become caricatured by some in Taiwan because it's an argument that the United States seeks to hollow out Taiwan's core industries and poach its top talent and top, uh, top technology to serve America's own ends. And TSMC has invested $40 billion in building a, a semiconductor fabrication plant in Arizona, which has become sort of a symbol for those in Taiwan who are not all, but some, who, who want to try to paint this as a, uh, as a pattern or an example of the United States seeking to hollow out Taiwan. So much like Congressman Moulton's comments at the start, Secretary Raimondo's call for a geographic diversification of the production of chips has become a source of anxiety uh, in Taiwan. And the common link between these two statements is that people in Taiwan grow anxious when it feels like they are becoming an object in a competition between the United States and China. What I am here to try to sell you on is the idea that Taiwan is one of our most important and closest partners in the world. It is much more than a pawn in a great power contest. And so if the United States wants to keep Taiwan close, then we need to approach the relationship from that starting point. And in practical terms, this means that, yes, it's prudent for the United States to hedge by diversifying geographic production of semiconductor chips, but we should also accept that Taiwan's leading firms will want to keep their research and development and their production of the most advanced chips inside Taiwan. It also means that if the United States is concerned about Taiwan becoming overly dependent upon China, then we should offer Taiwan alternatives. Now, in fairness, the United States and Taiwan are making progress on an initiative called the U.S.-Taiwan 21st Century Trade Initiative. And this is moving in the right direction. This is a good step. Uh, it's positive. But it is not a substitute for a free trade agreement or a bilateral investment agreement. But even more than these, these steps, as important as they are, I think the United States also needs to maintain a little bit of perspective about the nature of cross-strait developments. We are not 
on the cusp of World War III in the Taiwan Strait. Now, I, I recognize that this may be at odds with some of the things that you read or hear or watch on television. Uh, so I trust that you may challenge me on this point. But before you do, here's my case. China's president, Xi Jinping, who I've met 13, 14 times, understands that if he loses Taiwan, that will be the only thing that history will, will remember him for. That will be the stain of shame for his family name for generations. And that is the outcome that President Xi is most motivated to avoid. And I do believe he would be willing to wage war to prevent uh, that stain of shame on his family name. Would Xi Jinping like to be the leader that returns Taiwan to China's embrace and unites greater China? Of course. Of course he would. That would guarantee him a spot on China's equivalent of Mount Rushmore. It would put him in the pantheon of China's great historic leaders. But is he willing to risk everything and enter into an unwinnable war with the United States to do that? That's a subject of debate. That's an unresolved debate. And I hope that it never does get resolved. Now, in the face of this uncertainty, some people believe that the United States must stare down China and get them to back off their ambitions on Taiwan. And I'm all for strengthening deterrence and working to convince China's leaders that it would be prohibitively costly and dangerous, that they would invite catastrophe if they ever sought to seize Taiwan by force. But ultimately, I guess the argument I'm trying to leave you with is that I think it will depend much more on smarts than on strength for us to get to that point. And, and here's what I mean. Uh, first, we weren't able to compel China to abandon its ambitions on Taiwan when we had a dramatic uh, advantage in overall national power and military dominance over China in the last century. So it's probably even less likely today when the United States and China are moving closer to parity and overall national power that we will be able to muscle China into abandoning their ambitions. And second, we shouldn't lose sight of what works. We have maintained peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait for the past 40 plus years. And the cross-strait equilibrium has held in part because it has been mutually unsatisfying to all three sides. No one has been able to get everything of what they wanted. But each side has operated with an understanding of each other's core requirements and has worked to avoid violating them. And I think it's in our interest to make sure that the status quo continues to hold into the future. And this leads to the final point uh, before I turn things back to Deborah, which is that Taiwan really is not a military problem with a military solution. I would argue Taiwan also is not a, a problem with an American solution. The United States is not a party to the unresolved civil war between both sides of the Taiwan Strait. Neither side of the Taiwan Strait welcomes or invites the United States to play a mediating role. And I think that we would do more to alienate and trouble the situation than help it if we ever tried. But what we can do, what we must do, is to try to keep a path open for the two sides of the Taiwan Strait to resolve their differences peacefully. And this process could take years, it could take decades, it could take longer, it could take centuries. I don't know. But in order for Taiwan to sustain leverage and pre preserve its political autonomy and strengthen its democratic way of life, it needs to continue to be able to grow its economy. And in order to do that, the United States and Taiwan need to maintain a, a strong and mutually beneficial relationship. And in order to sustain a strong and mutually beneficial partnership, the U.S. and Taiwan need to find ways to show consideration for each other's top priorities and their top concerns. And this, need, that this means that the United States will need to operate with an understanding of, of some of Taiwan's sensitivities to fears of being hollowed out or being used as an instrument in a great power competition. And it also means that Taiwan has work to do as well to deliver sustained strong performance, to lift up their people, to further embed themselves at the heart of the global economy, and to be seen as a complementary economic partner uh, for the United States. Because ultimately, a, a strong Taiwan is in America's interest. And Taiwan's strength is built upon its economy, and its economy is enhanced through its links with the United States and the rest of the world. So 
I actually am, am rather confident that the United States and Taiwan are up to the task. I think that it's in, imminently possible, and I think it's in both sides' interest. And if I have left you with nothing else, uh, I hope that I leave you with, with one thought, which is a small bit of optimism that Taiwan's potential is strong and the future of the U.S.-Taiwan economic relationship will be vibrant. So thank you so much. I look forward to our conversation. introduce our two speakers on the supply chain panel today. First, we have Ms. Tina Chen, who until recently was head of strategic sourcing at Swarovski, the jewelry, watch, and accessory maker. She has left Swarovski to focus on a master's degree in communications leadership here at UW. She has over 20 years of experience with, with major uh, corporations, including Tommy Bahama, Zara, Coach, and of course Swarovski. She's been involved in a wide range of roles in merchandising, product development, and sourcing uh, in regions covering Asia and North America. She has an in-depth understanding of the flexibility that today's supply chains need to support modern retail firms from the factory all the way to the customer. Outside of work, Mrs. Chen has been very uh, uh, generous in her time in volunteering to mentor UW students and also to give um, speeches here. And so she's been serving somewhat as a bridge between academia and business. She received her bachelor's degree here at the Foster School in Finance, and as I said, she's working on a master's degree here. Our second speaker is Mr. John Hadawani, President and General Manager at J.C. Grand an engineered fasteners manufacturing company which makes, exports, and distributes industrial fasteners and related hardware components. The company is based in Taiwan with factories in Taiwan and China. In the past, Mr. Hadawani has worked for the Boeing Tech Center and at two biotech startups focused on large-scale gene expression lab automation. He moved to Taiwan in 2005 to take on the role he has as president of J.C. Grand. He has a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering and quantitative economics from UC San Diego and a PhD in aeronautical and mechanical engineering from the California Institute of Technology along with an MBA degree from the Foster School. So we thank them both for taking time out of their very busy schedules to join us today. So we will first have Ms. Chen talk, and then she will be followed by Mr. Hadawani. Please. Hi, everyone. It's such an honor to be here. Um, and with John, my good friend, <laughs> and, I, you know, and Ray in the back there, hi. Um, so um, I'm here to share about my experience working for, uh, for uh, Coach and Swarovski, um, and it's a, a little bit about the disrisking China, um, like sort of experience from the company's perspective, more strategic from the company's perspective. So um, sorry, I have to look back because those are my little notes. Um, so I. Both Coach and Swarovski have had this um, strategy to decouple, sort of um, move their supply chain base out of China towards, you know, more towards Southeast Asia. Um, and for Swarovski, in the past two years, they even wanted to come all the way over to um, America, like Central and South America. Um, but they're a little bit different in terms of their strategies and the timelines um, because the companies are both different in their, a little bit in their characteristics and company cultures as well. Um, so I'm going to talk about Coach first um, since I joined Coach um, before I joined Swarovski. So Coach started their um, moving away from China strategy since 2012. That was quite early. Back then, there was no... Um, political issues between the U.S. and China. It was purely because of the uh, increasing costs, like labor costs. Um, I think there was also the, the insurance um, 
costs, are, you know, for for uh, not just the labor itself, but also the insurance around um, around that, and um, for 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 workers. Um, so that was the main reason, and then they also moved the sourcing office from Hong Kong and China to Singapore entirely. They closed that um, sourcing office from Hong Kong and China to Singapore. And that, th I thought that was really strategic because um, at back then, I don't remember exactly which year they moved, but then it was more um, also for cost reasons and there was pretty much no need. After they moved all the factories away from China, they don't feel like there was a need to put a sourcing office near there. So, um, and Coach was 100% external manufacturing. It, what I mean by that is they don't own any of their factories. They pretty much partner with all the, you know, uh, the, the business owners. And it's, it was 100% external. At, in the beginning, it was 100% external in China. But um, don't rem remember exactly. A few years later, they were able to move 90% of their external manufacturing from China to Vietnam the Philippines, and now they're thinking about moving to India as well. So, um, so it, I think they were able to achieve that. Or they actually completed this whole project, this uh, this recent, like move ninety percent to uh, over to Saudi Southeast Asia before I even joined um, Swarovski. So that was like, I think they achieved it within, I think I joined Swarovski around two thousand fifteen. So it was, they were quite fast. Um, Flexible. I think mainly because they had really strong relationships with their supplier, very strategic. Actually, Coach did not spend a penny to move out of China. They basically told the suppliers, "Hey, I want to move out of China. Why don't you invest in a in a new country for me?" And the suppliers all follow their um, order pretty much. And um, and also, Coach had a very strong um, engineering team. So, um, and they were able to achieve the knowledge transfer, like transferring the in, um, how to make the bag from like China to, they basically sent their own team from China to, you know, to Philippines, to, to Vietnam, to be stationed in, in these factories and teach the local workers how to do it. So I thought that was pretty smart, you know, because they had this advantage. Um, and also because they don't own any of the factories, very strong cash flow. They were able to achieve it right away. So I think these are the main factors. A uh, coach was able to do it, like, you know, really streamlined, flexible, and fast. Honestly, I think coach should be on, in the textbook, <laughs> in the supply chain textbook. But anyways, um, so I'm going to move on to Swarovski, which is a, a little bit, um, they are on the right track, um, um, moving away from China, but they didn't start thinking about it until 2019. Um, when Trump and, uh, um, you know, the Trump administration, you know, uh, 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 putting all those policies towards China, that's, that was when my boss, the VP of sourcing, decided, hey, we need to do something. Um, but that, I thought that was a little bit late. Um, and and it was, they moved to China not just because of the increasing cost, but also because of the politics I was mentioning, Trump, between Trump and China, as well as the environmental. It was before, right before COVID. When we decided to move out of China, the COVID did not start yet. But it was all that like transparency, like the the lack of transparency in, in supply chain, and Co um, and Swarovski wanted to be a more sustainable brand. So then that was one of the strategy as well. Um, also because Swarovski had. Um, it's more like the supplier relationships uh, reason that they want to move out of China and because uh, out in um, they want to develop the stronger supplier relationships. Uh, yeah. So, um, so however, Swarovski is um, not they're not 100% external manufacturing. There's about um, they, they uh, Swarovski owns part. Uh, they, we own our own factory in Thailand and Vietnam, about 60% versus 40%, 60% internal versus 40% external. So that's um, that's that's a, a sort of a internal strategy, but then it also um, limited the cash flow. So when the pandemic hit, there's a lot of um, cash, flow, cash flow concerns, and that kind of um, sort of delayed the whole project uh, timeline because of the uh, cash flow. Um, 
So, so Swarovski does have this strategy to move the external manufacturing. Internal, you can't really move because that's your factory. You still have to sort of, you know, uh, make sure you pay your workers and give them enough um, production and all that. But Sarasi does plan to uh, move the external manufacturing to Mexico and India. And that's one reason why I came back to the States working for Sarasi because uh, they wanted me to source in Mexico, you know, for the, to make the products. Um, However, the, I think the, the, uh, the difficulty about local, this local sourcing strategy is, is, about, is that there's la it's lack of the local um, skillful masters. We call Sifu. You know, like in Chinese, we call Sifu. Basically, these are the masters. They know how to make these jewelry pieces by hand. And um, over in the new, uh, especially in Mexico, there, there's not m many workers like that. And so, um, Sarasi had to send their engineering team from Thailand, from China, all the way to Mexico, and stationed in Mexico for like two, three months and teach the local workers how to do it. That also delayed the entire timeline. Um, and also there's a, a little bit of conflict between internal and external manufacturing within Swarovski. As you can imagine, internal factories, they want, they want loads, they want POs, you know, because they want to pay the workers. Um, they are reluctant to teach the skills to the external manufacturers. So therefore, um, it, it, a little bit of because of the company culture and strategies, it's making it uh, a little bit of, uh, it, it's a more difficult process uh, for Swarovski. But it, it, they are definitely on the right track. I just think that there are some limitations to achieving it. So um, that was a little bit my little bit my sharing from uh, working for these two countries. I mean, there's two two companies, and they are definitely on the right track, though. So, yeah. Great. Thank you so much, Dina. <laughs> John. I think I got this. I'll I'll, I'll sit here. <laughs> um, I'm going to comment on some supply chain considerations. Let's say over the last decade or so. Um, uh, from a perspective of a business owner and uh, CEO of a manufacturing operation, um, our company, it's not a company advertisement, our company is about 150 million US dollar equivalent in revenue, so it's squarely in the mid-size enterprise, uh, at least from a Taiwan perspective. Again, headquartered in Taipei, uh, the most important thing to keep in mind for this context is number one, I've been in Taiwan since 2005, so it's almost, you know, it's better part of 20 years. So I've been through the pre, during, and post great financial crisis, which occupied a lot of my attention for the first decade I was there. And now the pre, during, and post COVID, uh, which was sort of occupying uh, for the last five years or so. So it's a pretty exciting ride. Um, the, uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that we do have oper uh, manufacturing operations both in Taiwan, in the south, in Kaohsiung, and in uh, and in China, in, near in the Shanghai region, generally. So that's important. We can't, you know, it, I have to play it pretty, pretty even keel between Taiwan. It's not. I, I definitely don't get into the geopolitics of this because I'm, I'm invested in both places. Um, and and I think the third, you know, the third thing is that we have substantial oper or substantial market in the North American supply chain, which, for my purposes, since I supply a lot of industry, it's. Uh, Canada, U.S., Mexico, um, which has its own dynamic, too. I don't know what they're calling it now. It used to be NAFTA. Now it's NAFTA, too, or whatever they call it now. Um, so that's, that's an important context. So in the, I've kind of separated into sort of the pre-COVID area. So that's, I had asked Ryan a question about trade agreement, but more from a national security perspective, which is not my, my background. But certainly from an economics perspective, uh, I was... Although, you know, my personal feeling aside about the TPP, uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership, from a business owner that had operations in China and Taiwan, the TPP was going to exclude both of them, as Ryan mentioned. That was worrying to me. Um, I could easily have seen, you know, our, uh, you know, the, we don't have super high tariffs on our products, but if, you know, if our, if our competitor, competitors in Southeast Asia had zero, that was, and it excluded both of my operations, that would have been a problem. Um, that 
kind of went away with the prior administration at the beginning of the prior administration. Um, from an from my personal perspective, that was a good thing. I don't know if it was a good thing uh, it, from a moral perspective, but um, then you had early in the prior administration when they started a little bit more of an aggressive trade stance towards China. The first salvo in the in the trade war was a 10% tariff that included all of my products. That was less of an issue. Um, so, the, probably within a month of a 10% tariff, the renminbi depreciated by 10%. I was able to cut prices to my customers by 10%, and business went on with, as if it didn't change. I, I can't speak for any other other industry, but for us, it was as if it, the 10% tariff did not happen. Um, I didn't lose any market share. I didn't reshuffle my supply chain. Then the 25% tariff hit a little bit later. Uh, that did affect things. Now, there was some, some portion of my, my product base I could still uh, ship to the, to the United States, even with a 25% tariff. You know, we still had, had comparative advantage. There's a little bit of a loophole in NAFTA, which is I can ship all I want into Mexico duty-free. And they could, as long as it's going into an assembly operation and it gets re-exported to Canada or the U.S., it sort of goes into in the back door in a way. So uh, a lot of that business from China to Mexico did not change. For product that would have gone directly to the United States, that definitely shifted. So luckily, I had a country hedge. So we had a lot of my US-based manufacturing went back to Taiwan. And I had more of my European and Australia, Japan focus sort of, we reshuffled it to, to, to uh, to put that back in, t in China. So there was definitely a little bit of a reordering, and I suspect that that happened across the supply chain that doesn't include my, you know, or broader than just my industry. Um, you saw reshuffling of supply chains, sort of de a lot of, uh, we, put, we postponed a lot of new investment in China because there's a lot of uncertainty about the future, uh, whether that was going to get worse, whether, you know, other, other, other countries would put uh, tariffs or extraordinary tariffs on China. So it really deterred investment in China writ large. That's, this is true, including myself. So as COVID happened, so this is at the beginning of 2020, I mean, I, was, I find it really interesting. The first reactions to my customers in the U.S. was, it was, if you can remember, kind of the quaint time when the U.S. felt that it really was an Asian problem. And they were, their concern was, are, are, is it going to affect our manufacturing operations? And so in Taiwan, Taiwan sort of is, you know, a small island. You, you sort of control ins and outs. And actually, we, we didn't, there wasn't a day off work we took. Um, we, it, life proceeded about the same way it did before COVID, during COVID in Taiwan. My manufacturing operations were not affected at all. China was uh, a bit trickier. They, they also kind of quarantined the country, but they also tended to quarantine municipal and provincial regions. So although my, my employees could go to work and we had largely the same you know, manufacturing schedule, if you wanted to get parts to the port, you had to go across a few jurisdictions, which required, it was, it was for, from a logistics point of view, it became kind of tricky. And that always delayed things by a few weeks. So thing, there were delays and frictions, but Within a month or two, you know, by, by let's say the end of the first quarter, 2020, it was pretty much fine, and then it shifted more to the the overseas markets, and that's where you know, and you, I think this audience knows very well. I mean, the the I was worried about demand Armageddon in 2020. I actually thought the demand would just tank, and it did. For the first like Q2 was horrible. Uh, in 2020. Then at the latter part of 2020 and 2021, we had an unprecedented amount, amount of orders. And I mean, my order book was full. I mean, the, the, the lead times went up on my manufacturing. I had an order book that was oversubscribed. And then it became a shifting of this, how do we get all this demand manufactured and overseas? And you, you saw articles about the port in Los Angeles and ships, you know, that was all true. I mean, I, I bring in containers. I, I have substantial distribution points, both in the US and in Mexico. And, you know, I used to bring a container to Chicago, maybe took from, from Port of Kaohsiung to door to door, maybe five weeks, standard deviation of a week. And it went to three months, standard deviation of two to three weeks. So it was really disruptive. And we had, you know, 
shifting, trying to get containers out of the yard, trying to airship things. Um, and my products are fairly heavy, so it's, uh, it really got really costly for both us and for our clients. And so that now we find, you know, post-COVID, goes in reverse, demands regularizing. I wouldn't call it tanking, but it's regularizing. My customers have a lot, you know, with this shipping lead times have shortened, manufacturing uh, lead times have shortened. Uh, that pipeline stock, which probably, you know, because of all the disruptions, was, you know, six months, you know, pipeline stock or more, uh, shrunk down to more normal lead times. And, and then the customers have stock overhangs. And so that's really the, the theme of 2023 is to work through stocks that were built up during the COVID era. Um, and then as Tina kind of mentioned, the supply chain, this is maybe more specifically to COVID. There's, two, you know, with supply chain de-risking, there's really two factors here. There's the, there's the geopolitical factor, which, you know, the elephant in the room is just the, the trade relations between the U.S. and China and Taiwan's, you know, kind of in the middle. Uh, that's one element of it. Um, and the second element of it is just what happens if something like COVID happens again. And what are we going to do about it? You know, will the, will the shipping lead times and everything? So I think b part of the answer to both both problems, both geopolitical and a potential future pandemic, is to geographically diversify, like kind of like Tina had mentioned. Uh, we won't abandon China. It's still an important part of our manufacturing, but we're also setting up in Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia is the new, the new China, okay, so in that way. Um, and we will have operations there probably within the next year. Um, the second thing is, and Tina also mentioned this, and this is true for our industry too, is to go downstream and, and just whether it's manufacturing in Mexico or, or nearshoring to the U.S., it could be that or, or just have more stock buffers to have a little more resiliency. I mean, I think the clients have accepted a little bit of extra cost for a trade-off for resiliency when the next pandemic, God forbid, hits. And so that's what I've been working on for the last six months. It's kind of seeing, gaming out how that might occur. Uh, customers are, I think, a little bit naive. Uh, I was just in Europe on a trade conference, and they were, uh, a lot of the customers were saying, well, you know, are you, are you in Vietnam? You know, what happens if the, the cross-strait crisis happens? And I, and I kind of had to kind of calm them down a little bit and said, I mean, if, really, if we get into that situation, which I hope it never happens, I don't think anywhere in the South China Sea is safe. I mean, you're, you might be able to manufacture in, in Ho Chi Minh City, but you're not going to get any containers out into the water. So, you know, I don't know that that does you very much good. So um, I think, yeah, so th those are some of the thoughts and some of the, the, some of the strategic considerations I've been dealing with for the last few years. Thank you very much, John.